that I don't know I've ever had a midweek update that has been as anticipated as the one I'm about to do. Uh, David Barclage, welcome in the dean of the Republican Party. You know, David, when I when I see the state and the condition of the state, I really think it's it's uh, whether you like it or not, probably as much your fault as anybody for the condition of the Missouri government. I'll take that. Some days. Most days. Yes. <laughs> David, thank you. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed our visit about statewide. I had this grand plan. We would just click through and do these state Senate races at the same time. But the response to it was so great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate this Stein that got sent to me almost in response to this. Uh, terrific, anonymously delivered Stein. It's just beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, let's what, start so off. I had a little bit of news. He was was every client I had in a race was not happy because yep. I didn't say enough kind about him. Every opponent wasn't happy because I'm still on the other side, but they were at least appreciative that I I, I didn't trash talk too much. So I had today, the opposite. I will continue to try my balance. I had every client you have in a race say, "Yeah, Dave did a great job." Oh. And every client in the race that you don't have say, gosh, he was so biased and he did nothing but screw us. And I'm like, well, you know, hire him. I don't know what to tell you. I was like, who's your guy? We'll, we'll do this with him next. But it's big shoes to follow when you follow David Barklage. Uh, big news in the last week. OK, you told me when this story before it broke, we were just talking hogs, dogs and logs. And uh, you were said there's something there's something there's something wrong here. And yep. I didn't pay much attention because I'm not the Speaker of the House and it didn't matter to me. And then when I saw the first story break, I'm like, oh, I, I smell bullshit here. Where's my button, Kelton? I have, a, I have my bullshit button here. I was like, I smell bullshit. Uh, and and I and I'm not saying that this this story again. I don't I don't have a beef with what the independent does. Uh, and, and I think their stories are not factually inaccurate. I mean, I, I think they don't misquote people. I think they're professionals. Uh, but but I was like, okay, now wait a minute here. Something's done. Something smell right. And every single thing since it's came out in this ethics committee process has has absolutely uh, confirmed my belief that this right on down to the post is them leaking to the post and then publishing a story trashing yourself and the people that testified last week. And they didn't even give a damn about Hannah enough or respect her enough to wait till the damn meeting started. <laughs> they ran it 15 minutes before it started. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll say a couple things. You know, the, the work of the committee is serious. Uh, it, it's taken a while, but I think that one of the challenges with term limits, I will say this, is a lack of historic, um, you know, uh, knowledge and and uh, the awareness of that history. To that regard, uh, I did talk, uh, which was outed before I even got in there that I was speaking, but I did give a analysis when we took the Senate over in 2001, we found significant institutional problems, corruption, uh, all kinds of problems where you had staff giving benefits to lobbyists at the expense of members. Uh, you had staff that was involved in criminal activity that when they were fired would, you know, throw out, oh my God, you're firing me because uh, it's personal or you're firing me because it's partisan, which wasn't the case. And in fact, we made a choice. We could have looked at investigations and all kinds of public hearings, or we just put our hunker down and Peter Kinder uh, wanted to see that the Senate was reorganized along with Bill Kenney in a way that all the members could move forward. And so the choice was made by leadership to work together with the Democrats, sometimes resistance, but uh, to work together to make things better. To that regard, Scott, um, I see the same things happening in the House now, that you have a staff after 20 years uh, and a majority has taken over, that <laughs> it, it is not to the benefit of the members. I care very much about the members, Democrat or Republican, being able to exercise, you know, for... I think you're letting people off too nice. Well, but, I'm going to get to that, but okay. I'm just saying the, is that the, I... The I, staff, I, yeah, okay. I, I just, I think that... Um, that if the body allows the staff to take out a, a speaker, uh, that will embody the staff at the expense of the membership. And I think that's exceedingly bad. In my well, when they allow the staff to pick the staff, or when they vote on procedures and they don't read them, that's just handed them by the staff. There, there is, yes, there's a staff problem. But as an old staffer myself, I'm, I'm calling bullshit on now you. 
it, it, there is nothing that happens there. The elected officials, the the buck, as Harry would say, the buck should stop with the members. And the members have been too lax. Let these childish games go on, and it's on them. I, I well, think the staff. No, I agree. The, I th the ethics committee has a decision, not just what's in front of them today, but the impact in the future. And and for example, the staff has put all the members in jeopardy. The staff and the staff alone by initiating investigations independent on members that they are paid uh, to work for and then leaking it to the press on like the 700 accounts. As we know, there is proof that the staff actually leaked the report <laughs> to the media or, or their investigation to the media. But with that being said, is imagine now you have every member of the House and Senate that has a problem with their report that maybe hasn't looked at it, like Dean, nine year or eight years into his term, who if the ethics committee, depending on what they do to Dean, that standard, you know, Dean was voluntarily giving the money back after finding the corrections before he was aware of an investigation. And now you're going to have members who are going to be that are already being sunshine, that any of them could have a liability and imagine what yeah, Dean screwed up. Dean, yeah. Dean did what he could do to make it right. Yeah. If this committee sends him a letter that says, hey, you know what? You're the leader. You should set the trend. You screwed up. Don't do it again. Well, that seems right, right? Because he did. That's all factual. And I, if I'm Dean, I, I may be tired of getting kicked around in this Warren Commission. But you know what? Fair enough. That's a bear. History looks back on it. He did screw up. He does deserve it. A, whatever you, a letter. Say, hey, you knock it off. But now you got everybody else at risk because of actions of staff playing a game investigating yes. independently their members and and imagine look we found they even their staff Senate. though david let me ask you this if you're a, if you're a house member that's going to come in tomorrow and you you see the lady or the gentleman at the desk is that even your staff or is that the clerk's staff well they're claiming that they're somehow independent of the house leadership and the house membership which is insane to yeah rob would have just fired me yeah look it all emanates from one person, clearly the clerk of the house uh, and probably uh, Dean's former, not probably, Dean's former chief of staff are the two individuals that everything seems to be coming back to for either, you know, for uh, creating this kind of turmoil. And look, the evidence of that is this. You have had one person as chief of staff over multiple speakers and majority leaders uh, you you have a governor who can't even communicate to the speaker. You have speakers, majority leaders who've been in battles. A job of a chief of staff is to fix those things. So at very least, it wasn't being fixed. But I suspect that for the benefit of that chief of staff, that you had a disharmony and 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 basically gridlock um, that benefited a few people, but certainly not the membership. So that needs to be looked at. I think that potentially Dean and Caleb Rowden have the opportunity to leave their legacy as a reformation uh, of the legislative process that's greater transparency, more member centric and greater accountability. I think that's an opportunity they can take from this lesson uh, in a positive way. On the negative side, look, this clerk, uh, her family has been involved and broiled in, in scandals uh since literally shortly after we took over that's part of it's the kind problem. of strange the, the the person i've heard other people describe you know about dane is not somebody that that's not the person i knew uh i i knew her not i don't want to say well but well enough always had a high regard for her. um i again i i go back to i just don't know that dana does some of these things without a complicit and almost absentee uh, legislators just not minding the store. Oh, I agree. And without term limits, you know, you've got leaderships that don't have any stick by the time you get to leader. Look, I, you've got a majority leader and a speaker who don't even know how to do the job because there've been fights between them and the person in front of them. So no one's there to help them in the office. So it means an over-reliance on staff. Yeah. Your Uber oh, driver did suck. I mean, that's just yeah. a fact. And look, so I think it's two dynamics. I think both you and I are correct, is that the members are responsible for not taking um, the responsibility to make it work and to take the burden off staff and put it on themselves to make sure things happen well. When you hand it to staff, they're going to put their own view. I mean, the idea that you can't yeah. you can't fire your own at will employee, the idea you can't put a flag out, the idea that 
that the staff can investigate and leak to the media. That's just not acceptable for. A I thought we were party. Republicans. Yeah, well, I don't think it has anything to do with what party. I think it has to do with the party of opportunity. No, this uh, is the party that says you you. Yeah. This is the party of at will employment. This is the I mean, party that I, says you know you are. <laughs> we don't have. We don't feel sorry for you. Get out there and make it happen, right? I agree. I, I think the the ethics committee, um, under the leadership of Hannah, has the potential to really make a statement here. Uh, to really lay the groundwork for a a opportunity to change both bodies uh, or they they can go the opposite way and and allow the staff to manipulate themselves and members um and do very much harm to the institution because like i said it is the staff has set it up where now people are sunshining everybody's records every member if they have a discrepancy in their account is now going to be liable is now going to be drugged through the press potentially and their careers uh, cut short or ruined because of staff uh, mismanagement of staff and staff misconduct. And that's sad because a lot of good people make mistakes on the reports. All right, let's get into these Senate races. Got it. Uh, let's let's start down the bottom. Greg Razor, uh, he's coming back, right? No, no, uh, no ambiguity there. Well, how do you say that's the bottom? My notes here, I've got District 1. You start with Greg Razor. Well, I, I don't think Greg even has an opponent, so. Well, yeah, I, okay, that's fine. You're going to skip around, so I've got my notes here so that I, I gave Let's you. Just, I'm, I'm down. Let's start with one. Doug okay. Beck's getting reelected. Am I wrong? Safe, Safe Democrat. Nothing's yep. going to happen there. The, the guy may be a placeholder, but he's not serious. I don't see serious money. Doug has got everything tied down. He's it's flat Doug good. It's flat Doug good. Yep. yep. Doug and flat Doug, you're good. Um, let, he he was sitting in this chair trying to convince me he had a race. I'm like, Doug, come on, man, killing me. Uh, let's talk about three Elaine Gann, and this is an interesting race. Uh, it started off as a three ways down to two way. Mike Henderson from St. Francis County. I would say when this district was drawn, the way the cards fell, it it helped a St. Francis County candidate in Mike Henderson. Um, Cindy Courtway, talented person. I mean, it's I mean, we didn't, if we're going to talk, let's talk. I, I I watched a friend of mine. When you're when you when you announce for the state senate, you are now a senate candidate. You are no longer a house member. And I watched a friend of mine just totally piss away what should have been not an easy race, but should have he should have won because he was doing house member stuff. And I watched Cindy Courtway have a very interesting week this week. Uh, are you going to be part of this clown show of an ethics commission? And if you are, reasonable people, I think it'd be very slow to cut a check to that. Uh, so, are you going to say I'm independent and can run my own race? I can do my own, like a, like a Senator, like a Senator. Then I, I, I think she's got the ball. I mean, it, it's great when you have the ball passed to you and you can make your play. Yeah. Cindy, I, I've known David, uh, her husband and Cindy, uh, I call David in this campaign, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the spouse, uh, because he, he, he acts, uh, he's constantly concerned about her welfare, wanting to make sure that everything happens well, which tells you a lot about their relationship, was, which is good. It, I, I agree with you. Big, I think, all that aside, big week for her. Yeah, it is. I, I think that how she handles the ethics committee uh, will speak volumes of her independence and, and of her strength. I think you're very much right on that. Um, Henderson has the geographical advantage, clearly, and it shows that in the polling early on. That we're going to see this pattern when we talk about these races several times. <clears throat> he has the geographic base in, in primaries, name ID, geographic base. Um, you know, those things are actually greater than ideology, but ideology in the modern Republican primaries are significant. And to that regard, she has the ideological advantage in, in a primary. That you is got some flakes down in Farmington. They've well, always had that yeah. crew of just weirdos. The whole district is uh, is ex Democrats who are very Tea Party, very alt right Republicans, and that space that Cindy's good in. Mike is more centrist. I, I'm not going to call him a rhino, Mike. If you're watching this, he's absolutely uh, not a rhino. I don't believe in rhinos. I think that's bullshit by people who are trying to label themselves. As Christians, when someone comes to tell me that they're a Christian and I'm not, I, I start to wonder about it. But when somebody says the word swamp, I immediately just bullshit yeah. goes off in my mind. I'm like, oh, here we go. Look, I think it comes down to this. I think it comes down to where the education reform community goes and where the education community goes. It's going to come Mike down to Kendall money. Mike is the former superintendent. 
Yeah. I would assume Cindy's willing to be for whatever they Cindy would like. Cindy is right? a, a school reform person, and this is going to be, if it's a priority by the education establishment, Mike Henderson wins. If it's a priority for the school choice movement, it's a very competitive race. I think that that it's going to come down to who runs a better campaign. Cindy's got a geographic disadvantage. She's got to make up by running a better campaign. Uh, Henderson has got, you know, his more centrist positions, which are not as popular in these primaries. Uh, and he's going to have to defend that to that regard. I think this is a toss up. But in the end, it's a safe R seat. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about five. Were you surprised after all the bluster? All the talk, no one files against Steve Roberts. All the, the Twitter threats, it just shows you Twitter's just not real. It's just not real. The the Roberts family are iconic in St. Louis yeah. politics. When I first got started and in Steve's politics, a damn fine senator. Her, her, uh, Steve's uh, dad, I believe it is, was on the uh, Missouri Municipal Board and actually took me under his wing, gave me some very good advice, class act. Uh, and to that regard, Steve safe, safe DC, safe for Steve. Uh, and there's always a lot of talk in urban politics, but Steve safe. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, so we already talked about Razor. Yep. Razor uh, safety. Then you uh, get District 9 I, at the, between Barbara Ann Washington and Brandon Ellington. I, I have to believe Barbara is safe. And that's, of course, a safety seat. Do you have a different well, I mean, it, I, I think you're like Doug Beck has an opponent, but I yep. think it's easy to say right now, the filing, he's safe. Yes, I think Barbara would be in the likely category. Brandon Ellington is a okay. former state rep, former elected official. Absolutely. He knows how to get votes. I, Barb does too. I mean, I, I agree. The incumbent senator in this situation has the, the definite advantage. Yep. But I think just counting out Brandon, uh, she has a more formidable opponent than someone I would say, well, let's just totally say. Yes. I, 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 I think it's somewhere in the territory. We're finding it so hard with all the media that's going to be out there this primary election yeah. to take out. It, um, and, and you'll hear that thing block sort of penetrate. So that's the reason I'd, I'd give a little more edge to her. Being an incumbent senator for four years, you should have built up some name ID, and it's awfully expensive to purchase nowadays. Uh, big shoes to fill on the 11th. I mean, yep. David, you've elected a lot of Republicans, but I, I don't think it'd be hard for you to admit J.J. Rizzo is up there with the Jay Watson, one of the finest post-term limit senators Absolutely. we've ever had. Absolutely. Uh, Callahan, him, there's a few yeah. the stars that have come from Kansas City that we all miss uh, and he will be missed. I think Aaron McMullen, um, you know, he's got uh, he's got a base because he's an incumbent and that base for a state rep is important in a Senate district. You know, you've got enough voters there that really help give you an early edge. But again, interesting Joe choice Nicola, there, though, he, he switched districts, right? Yep. He did better than he had any right to do against Senator Searpoint his reelection, but that's all in the southern part. He's he, he the, the dish was drawn at Drury Mount. He's in the eleventh. Yeah. If if you were Joe Nicola's guy, just I don't I know how close you to study it, but well, I really thought if he waited and ran in that district he did so well in, boy, he's a he's a top contender. Uh, it's an interesting thing to flip the script here and run again in an entirely new district. I agree, and and. I'll say this. One, I think Aaron has the, the the geographic advantage. I think Joe has the, again, what we're seeing out there. He's sort of that alt-right. I think he has the ideological advantage, which narrows that geographic advantage uh, somewhat. The problem for Joe is that I think that the Freedom Caucus <laughs> that supports him has so many races before them. Yeah. I don't see him getting the resources to do that well. And so I think I would watch how much the trial bar puts in there. If the trial bar pours in, they potentially could nudge that, uh, push that race towards Joe. If uh, Aaron is able to get the traditional money in, I think he is able to keep it. My view is it's a well, lean look at David Martin. There's district. a guy, David Martin, that's ran before though, David, and he's yes. going to run Joe Nicola. They'll, they'll say the same things. Nicola yep. obviously has proven himself to get votes where David Martin has not been. He's ran before, but not been as successful. But I mean, David Martin's going to be at all the same meetings Joe's at saying all the same yep. things to all the same Facebook groups. I, I think uh, David Martin is a, uh, is a bit of a barnacle on the Nicola boat. Well, I, I agree. And, and again, you know, I think it hurts the money and everything else. Uh, I give it as a lean to Aaron, but here's an interesting thing about this district. Let's talk about Robert Sauls for a minute. 
Robert Sauls yeah. has an equal, if not bigger problem on the ethics commission. You know, he, he is, uh, I was questioned by him at length. Uh, he was clearly, you know, wanting to engage. The problem is in this district that he's a minority member. I'm not sure that in this district, it, it is good for him to go after a Republican. Maybe it helps him in his primary, but whoops, he doesn't have one. And a general election being measured, being above the partisan fray is going to be the smart place to be. So what happens on ethics, what he says about what happens on ethics will definitely impact that election. What's interesting, though, this is this is the first district we're talking about where abortion, if it gets on the ballot, could actually yeah. make it competitive. <laughs> I, I say it is a toss up to lean R. Uh, and if abortion, uh, the abortion language gets on the ballot, I would call this a toss up because I think the Democrats will be able to focus on a couple of races in suburban, try to make it about abortion. Yeah. If there's a divisive primary, Aaron could be, or if it's Joe, could be very weak in a general. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, it starts off that primary, it's going to be Lean McMullen. McMullen's a good politician. He did a yeah. good job, at not just getting votes. He won his race for state house. I, I, I think McMullen's the, the slight favorite, and I think that favorite will grow I mean, I, I think there's some groups that are going to back him in a significant way. I think it's going to cost him all his money in the primary, which is the way it goes anymore. I think David Martin, uh, those votes, if it is close and the trial bar does come in big, how interesting would it be if you were a preacher and you were just new into politics and you always thought, well, the Democrats are for the trial attorneys, rules are the business people, and you get in and right away it's like, no, we're going to go to the trial bar. That's going to be an interesting. If you're Joe Nicole, it's an interesting dynamic to think through. Uh, I, I think in the general, it's totally a toss up. I think Democrats yeah. can fully fund this race. I yes. think this is territory they used to win on. They know they know this area very well. I and I think what's going to come down to is is the is the abortion thing on the ballot in August at all? If it's on in November, I think it goes from toss up to lean D. I think if it's not on this race, forget forget August. I think folks have shown right to work show people don't remember anything from August to November. I think if it's on the ballot in November, the Republicans have a problem. If it's not, I think it's a lean R. But but I, we're talking the leans here are the most lean leans lean. Not I don't think it's a. I think it's going to come down to national mood. Is Joe Biden lucid? Can Trump shut up? I mean, there there's a lot of things that this will be a, a razor's edge race. I think it if will. it's Nicola, you know, if you're Robbie Sauls, you're like, give me some Nicola, right? Absolutely. And it'd be interesting if the Democrats try to play in the Republican primary and tip yeah. it to Cola. If I were them, I would. Yeah, that, that, to me, that's that's the move. I'd pull uh, the McCaskill move. <laughs> and, you know, she used to be prosecuted there, right? Yep. Uh, Angela Mosley. Interesting. You got the you got the machine uh, up in North County and you have a, a new a, a legislator running against her. Uh, Chantel is a very pleasant person, very yes. pleasant to meet. Good politician has an amazing story about, and I, and forgive me if I say this, but battling cancer while, um, uh, from the, and, and she traces it could be related to the, to the, uh, landfill site. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cinder Mosley though. I mean, she's, she's got the respect of her colleagues. She's done a good yes. job. Uh, I, that is not the part that is not my, my neck of the woods, David. Tell me the dynamics there. You know, I actually think you hit the dynamics right. You've got sort of the machine versus the outlier. Um, the problem just is, is we saw a shift in urban politics because of a lot of the money coming from Soros, where it funded the activist versus the traditional, like uh, Cori Bush versus, uh, versus uh, um, Congressman, uh, who was Congressman for Cori Bush? Clay. Clay. Um, but I don't see that dynamic here. So I don't know really. The great One of the great, one of my uh, viewers sent me this. They made some beer called Great St. Louisans. In honor of this, his father, Bill Clay. Yeah. We don't do stuff like I, this anymore. I, I, I just, I, I'm not sure how you take Mosley out. She's got, you know, the establishment, except, <laughs> you know, of course, you know, there's a lot of anti-establishment out there. But in this district, it's still a lot more of the traditional establishment. So a lot I give of folks thought, a lot of folks not only in this town but down in St. Louis in, that weren't in North County. The difference between North County and North City. Uh, if you weren't a North County person, you thought Tommy Pearson was going to win that race. That's right. Angela Mosley come in and stole it. I don't think this will be a race on media or mailers to go be on the doors. And yep. it, 
I don't know if Chantel can knock enough doors. I don't know the dynamics well enough. I would say I'm with you. It's got to be lean the incumbent until somebody proves otherwise. Let's talk about one of the more fun races. This could be a fun general too, but uh, the, the primary in the 15th, um, you got a horse in that race? I do. Um, Jim Bolin. Tell me about him. I know Mark Carter. I know David Gregory. Tell me about Jim Bolin. Bolin is originally from Texas County. So uh, he runs and uh, owns a insurance company that insures physicians. Uh, he's knocked on over 12,000 doors, raised some fairly considerable funds. Is that real though? 12,000 seems a, like a lot. Oh uh, no. Uh, the guy sends me pictures every weekend uh, throughout the winter. He was knocking and at one point. He looked like a giant cone <laughs> head because he had this, this clear, uh, thank God it was clear. Otherwise it would have looked like something else. But <laughs> it was uh, a clear cone he head. He would not on. have been helpful in North County. You're saying no, no, but, uh, Anyway, he's a very hard worker. He's one of the best candidates that I've seen. But let's look at the race. Mark Carter, in one respect, is the one to beat. Because yeah, because, I mean, look, there's a floor of people that have voted for Mark Carter in the past. Yes. They're going to recognize that name and vote. Mark. They're going to be taking vacation this summer. They're not going to care. Let me, but let me just get back. Because the one thing I love, the, more, the most comments I have is when I ask you about how things actually worked. It is knocking doors in a state senate race in the winter. Can people in Chesterfield remember that? Do, do, now, they, do they know? Okay, t tell me how that how you decide when's the right time to start door knocking in the suburban district like that. Well, look at Koenig, look at Mary Elizabeth, yeah, yep. and I'll, I'll, you'll see it with Christopher Nelly. All of them started doors early. And we're seeing is that it is so hard to move numbers on traditional media. That ground game is important. And, you know, Jim will finish the district, which is something fairly incredible. Plus, he's got. You know, he's likely to have the Young Americans or some other group potentially in that district for him as well. He's got Tim Jones. He's got Tom Smith. Uh, he's got our shop. He's got a lot of sort of diverse support. So I like him as the upcomer. I think most people look at that. And, and Harder's problem is he has not been able to raise money before. And so he's got what he's got going in. How do you win that without raising money? I mean, well, I think when I see St. Louis well, County Council, I think a lot of money comes through there. I would assume you could raise money. No, because they, in the minority there. What's the deal? You just maybe. I just think it's really just more that he's not a strong fundraiser. Ernie Trakas is a very strong member of the council, but Ernie doesn't raise much money. And is and it just I, the ethos of that that you don't do a lot of fundraising, so people aren't used to getting asked, and so they don't do it? Well, you, you saw Steve Stanger, who you know was maybe too focused on fundraising. And to that regard, you know, it's just a touchy area uh, because you're dealing with a lot of contracts. You're really close in. Yeah, and you so are I the think, appropriator, right? Yeah. And so I, I just think that in that race, county council members, uh, they've got great name ID, but they have to translate that by raising What's Harder's money. floor? There is uh, a floor for Harder. I, I, the other two may not have one. What is his floor? Oh, I, I think he's he's a solid 30%. Uh, really? Which puts him in a three-way race real good. I mean, look. Sure. 24 to 30 percent. I think that's what he can end up with because I don't think he's going to grow much. Gregory's going to have money. Yeah. The trial bar likes Gregory. Gregory looks good, but I haven't seen him execute much of a campaign. Um, good and, visuals down at the border, right? I mean, that was pretty good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, any visual with David, forward. frankly, is going to be a pretty solid visual. It is, except he's 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 kicking sand in the face of people he shouldn't, and I think that's going to cost him a lot. He's got things in his back. a lot of Mexican nationals in Chesterfield? Uh, no, no. Um, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't get it. Well, I, I won't disclose here, but I can just say this, is that David has a very controlling view of his campaign. I don't think he shares much outside. He makes decisions. He sees enemies. When you don't have a broad group helping you, you tend to personalize things. And I think David's reactions on things already in the campaign, he's taken it very personal. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of people. state reps go to state Senate. I've not seen many St. Louis County council members go to state Senate. I'm trying yep. to think of one. I don't remember one. I've also not seen a lot of suburban mayors go to the state Senate. Uh, you know, to me, Gregory comes in with the money, harder shows the name ID. Gregory, yep. probably a little more talented politician. Got yep. a great look. I mean, the reason he raised that money, I, I honestly, I've heard great things about Jim Bowen. Everybody that's met him. I've never met him. I don't know him. Um, but tell me how this guy goes from Wildwood mayor uh, and kind of bucks a trend of going to state Senate. 
Uh, I think hard work, raising the right money and executing a good campaign. And like I said, he's got Tim Jones and he's got uh, a diverse group of people. I think he's on track uh, to get some solid endorsements. And the other thing is this guy, when I, you know, I think on uh, school choice, he's in the right place on that. Um, and, and on school issues, I think he's going to be in a very good place. You know, I, I just, Aren't I they think. they all going to vote for that stuff? They're in, the, well, they're in Chesterfield. They're the capital of that stuff. No, I, I get it. But I'm just saying is that I just think that Jim is the guy day in and day out that executes harder. And yeah, I have a bias there, I but I like Mark Carter. Mark Carter is a good guy. You know, he's, he's had an unenviable service, you know, being on the city ca uh, yeah. county council has earned it. Tough times. Gregory is one of the few people on this show. I'm not going to say much good about he's already reached out uh, and attacked me. And to that regard, it just shows an immaturity and he's got vulnerabilities and, and they'll be exploited to that regard. Well, I'll say good things about if I'm making the case for Gregory, Dude. it's I'm the best politician. I can raise yeah. the most money. Uh, I mean, I, they'll all tell you they've knocked a ridiculous amount of doors. I guess we'll find out in August who's, I, I, I that the, all the door numbers I hear while it's still cold outside, I'm like, eh, come on now, really? Now, now somebody's telling the truth, like Andrew Koenig, if he told me he's knocked a million doors, I'd probably be like, well, damn, he probably did. That yep. dude is a door knocking fiend. He's like, Andrew Koenig is the gold standard of door knocking for, for politicians I've ever seen in my life. I went and knocked a few doors with him. And I was just, I had to stop because my tubby ass was weighing him down. If you want the truth, I didn't want to be in his way. Uh, to me, I believe his door numbers. I don't believe the rest of them. I, I never believe anybody's. I, I promise I, you, I Jim. Do. Jim has added them up every week, and he's okay. Been but out what's there. it? That's like high school, right? You take the guy's number and divide it by two, and you take the girl's number and multiply it by two. I kind of apply the same theory to door for everyone, not just your guy. Uh, I say today, okay. as, as the race starts, harder, harder. Harder than the lead. favorite only because Gregory Gregory's should be money. able to win. Would you rather I, have name ID or money, David? In that race, I'd rather have money, but I, I think yeah, name ID, if you don't spend your money right, can be a bitch. And and you know, ask David Wassinger in his race. Close to uh, him. you know, he spent some good money, but maybe didn't spend enough and spend the wrong places. And and as a result, he lost. In this case, I think harder you have to make as the lead going in, but I think he goes down. I think Gregory, if he works hard and he's focused and he listens to people, he'll be hard to beat. But I, I like I like my guy in this race because he's got a work ethic second to none. And he's got Frank uh, Cantazaro as his campaign manager, which I, Frank, hate, I would tell you, there is no college. staffer in this state I've seen come on stronger and harder the last 24 months than Frank. I think Frank Cantazaro went from a guy – and then it, the the switch flipped. I've seen him with lobbyists. I've seen him with politicians. Frank Canzaro, in my opinion, is becoming one of the strongest political operatives in this state. And it, it just, I mean, he was always good. I mean, Frank's always been talented. Somehow in Frank, a light switch went off lately. And I'm telling you, the guy's on fire. I, I, I think that's, a, I didn't know he was actually running that kid. That's a big deal for him. I want, to, I want to stop and say two things. One, Mike Carter is flirting with me. And two, Mike, Kurt, oh, Mike. Mike Carter's opinions are always correct. Well, it's just a damn hard to get one out of him, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Lauren Arthur's. What a cluster that's been. That's just been a mess for Republicans. I yeah. mean, my God. Uh, at first, you had Holbert, which I was like, okay, you know, I, I like that guy. I like his, uh, I like his uh, cousin. Hey, by and the he way, out. stop real quick, Joe. Per uh, I would not cut oh, out yeah, the yeah, Democrats. Yeah. This is the other side. Uh, Joe was former counsel for for Drury, very capable guy. He's going to have money. Good dude. This is another one that should be a lane Republican that I think may be a toss up in the general election. If Go that ahead, abortion we'll thing is on vote. in November, I think that's a toss up yeah. too. But but yeah. but kudos to the Democrats though for getting a good candidate. Absolutely. They did their job and got a great candidate and put them in a position to, for good things to happen. I, right. I, it, you've told me the story about how in '80, not that many people ran that Reagan would lose. And then they all got swept like Bill Emerson. 82, they all thought he would just kill it, and he didn't. Then they didn't run in 84, and the, Reagan killed it. I've heard you tell those stories before and how, you know, you got to have the candidates ready to go for when your ship comes in. They can be ready to go. The 17th is Lauren Arthur. Yes. So uh, this was so interesting. I had Jerry in here, who's a great artist. I pulled up the, the old toilet lid with Rod's face on it, he drew. It says, my parents said I could be anything I wanted, so I became an asshole. Uh, Maggie Nuremberg's totally talented. I mean, she's yeah. the total package, raises money, doors, energy, can do media. Uh, 10 on 10 recruit for the Democrats. 
the last day, old Jerry Nolte comes in. Great vote getter. He has no primary to worry about. I think he took this race from a safe Democrat to, to a lean Democrat. Uh, the, the district's trending Democrat. Boy, Jerry Nolte's been getting Democrats vote for him for a long time. He has. Look, I think that it's going to come down to the Senate committee. Uh, the Senate committee, one of the things that we always did is we tried to get offense out of the way early. Uh, I mean, defense out of the way early and make the November elections all about offense. Um, and to the extent that and then we had the money to execute on it so that we always had two or three Democrats fighting for their lives and no Republicans. In this case, you know, we, we have to concede the 19th district already. So we've got one loss. We've got one that we could pick up in the 11th. So Can I ask you another procedural question, David? Yeah. Is Cindy Olaf from the biggest fool in this state? If she saves one dime for November that she couldn't spend winning the real elections that matter, Maggie Nuremberg will be a good good senator. She'll be number 11. If you're Cindy O'Loughlin, how in the hell do you not fund your candidates in the primaries? I mean, what, what kind of fool would you be to leave a dollar left for in August that for some November race? So let's be honest, there'll be some money coming anyway. But but frankly, for the trajectory of this state, if you're Cindy O'Loughlin, your headaches in February aren't going to be decided by who wins in November. They're going to be decided by who wins in August. Yeah, I, I... You make a very good point. Um, unfortunately, it, it falls in the face of the logic that I promoted for 16 years and running. It's a Senate different races. world than you when you were taking the majority. It is, and in fact, we fought hard so there weren't uh, divisions in primaries with senators because then it it went over onto the Senate floor, which we have seen that when True, senators that that, that dam has been breached. It, it was, in fact, we ended it with Sarah Stillman. Uh, some old history here is that when we first did the Senate, there was a choice between Sarah Stillman, David Broach, who's running in the Jefferson County, which wasn't ready yet. Sarah Stillman running against Mike Leibar in a district that even though a Democrat controlled it, it had all the right demographics. And then against um, in the in the Platte County seat with uh, Eric Zahn running and the Senate fractured and part of the Senate wanted Eric Zahn, part of the Senate wanted uh, David Broach and I wanted Sarah Stillman because our demographers and pollsters said, this is the race where you can pick up and beat a Titan. And to that regard, we use that cycle to say, Hey, look, trust your staff, trust the experts. And we were able to pick up that one. The other two lost. And I think she that, may be very involved in that, in that Senate district three. Yeah. Certain things go. I think she should be, it could be a very visible figure in Crawford County where she represented for a very long time and still very popular. Uh, I, I agree. And that that changes the dynamics there of who she might help or might not help. Uh, and to that regard, though, we were able to sort of turn it around and get senators really to give through the fund and, and to help recruit and got them involved in recruitment. Wildly successful. But is that day over? And now the race yeah. is in August and you better you better if you don't win in August, you may not be around to decide who wins in November. But you know what? We went from 26 seats and we're losing every time and the support to Cindy O'Loughlin to give money to general elections. And look, they're going to have the 11th, they're going to have the 15th, and those are going to be, you know, uh, ones that they need to either protect or win. They're going to lose the 19th and the 17th could be an opportunity for them if they have the money. If they don't, then they're falling back to just hoping they, they can either break even or only lose one this cycle, which would be a tragedy. If you're Sidney O'Loughlin, would you rather have three more of your allies in the Republican caucus or one more Democrat that's not even your problem? I know shooting at you. I mean, you, I, you I don't. I just don't see how if you're her and Drew sitting at the table doing math. How, I'm not does, saying you're wrong. I just hate yeah. to say you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the 17th. Look, I, I have a. I, I actually like Chuck Basie. I'm very hard to offend. Maybe impossible. And look, is Chuck going to win? No, uh, he's running against Stephen Weber. But good for Chuck for putting – I like to – he ran for school board, right? He bitched about schools for eight years, right? Hates them. I don't really know that people that really like the Columbia School District, but he hates them, right? And he ran for school district. That's Chuck's a smart guy. He knew he was going to get his ass kicked, but he yes. ran anyway. And I was like, I respect the hell out of a guy, puts his name on the ballot, stands up for what he believes in, doesn't apologize, makes his case. Now, does Chuck say some crazy stuff? Yes. Is it? Is he? Does he embarrass himself? Some, of course. I'm not going to co-sign off on some of the stuff he's sent a message on. But as far look, I, but I'm not very offended either. In the time of Donald Trump, Trump, does anybody shock anybody? 
Well, some of his messages if the, that I saw Weber tweet were a little a little out there, maybe. But you know what? I say good for Chuck for running. I, I obviously it's a it's a likely yeah. Democratic seat. Stephen Weber's a hell of a kid. He'd be a good senator. He is, but, but you know what? Chuck for running. Let's just say this. In a way, it's a bad match because Steve Weber it's... is always an inch away from being a victim. And I've seen some of his tweets whining about something a Republican says, and it's like, Steve, you're above that. And and the fact yeah. that Steve allows himself to be drugged down. But don't you think when he's a senator, he'll grow into spot. it? What's Everybody that? thought Jill Senator was going to be this dumpster fire of a senator and awful. Jill Senator was a Jill Shoup was a very good senator. Now, yes. if you're a Republican, you didn't agree with her and all that. But as far as respecting the chamber, absolutely, I thought she was good. I agree with you about some of his tweets are like, you're Stephen Weber's a legitimate war hero, like, right? Like and he just needs to look past that stuff. And if he's ever yeah. would, if he watched your show, I'd say, Steve, play the game at your level. Don't allow yourself to be drawn down into petty fights because that's the difference between leadership and politics. <laughs> but do you think Leaders when he walked into that chamber as a senator, talk about big things. sometimes when you walk into that chamber as a senator, that takes care of itself. Yep. And I think that might be the case with Stephen Weber. I hope so because he could be transformational in the Senate yep. as a Democrat like a Callahan or like a Rizzo or even bigger, but he's got to grow to be a leader and not a politician. Let's see. Truman but he here. wins that. He wins. He oh, wins 19, I think, going down. There's an old story about Bill Kenny when they were renaming the, a bond for the Mizzou or something. And every time Ken Jacob, he had a little Mizzou tiger sit on his desk. And whenever Ken Jacob would stand up and want to be mad, he would shake the little tiger at him. And Ken would end up sitting down. Uh, so it matters. It just matters that you're in the majority party, even in the yeah. Senate where it's not supposed to. It does. When the when Mizzou, when Truman, when you were a dumpster fire back in 15, Kurt Schaefer saved that ass. I mean, Cliff Smart could have came and got a haul. Cliff Sha Cl uh, Kurt Schaefer saved your ass. Now you're going to have a Democrat, which I know, nothing wrong with that. Your, your name is Truman, hell. But now we go to the 21st. You have Curtis yeah. Gregory, former Cotton Bowl winner, uh, farmer uh, from Saline County versus Doug Ritchie from the suburbs of Kansas City. Uh, if you're Truman, you better elect the old lineman, right? If you don't, oh, no. Better but watch out. But I have to say it's probably a toss-up. Again, oh, totally. the ideological advantage in the world we live in Don't uh, favors to Doug Ritchie. The geographic advantage, they're about even. Oh, he's not listening. He, you're depressing him. It's a matter oh of who runs the better. Moon stop, uh, and, and broadcast. I think I think Gregory's got a little bit of an uphill climb. But if anybody can do it, he can. He's got star qualities. You know that star when you're quality. around. Star quality. I tell you what, Doug Ritchie's a damn good politician. Yeah, damn good. And and he, Doug Ritchie here. Don't listen, Truman. I'm gonna plug your ears. Uh, Doug Ritchie knows how to talk to that kind of angry suburban guy. Mm -hmm. He knows that guy. He is that guy. He knows how to get that guy fired up. He is a very good politician. He is a good fundraiser. Uh, there are folks I've found that take this race a little lightly for Curtis. That is a major mistake. Doug Ritchie can absolutely win this does. race. And, and I think you could ask, not Truman, but you could ask someone else, and they can make a case he's the favorite. Yeah. I think Curtis Gregory is going to have – let me ask you the real question. What is the fundraising advantage Curtis Gregory needs to win that race? You can listen to this, Truman. So, you know, the problem is it's in the Kansas City market, which just sucks uh, in terms of efficiency. I, I think if yeah. I were running his campaign, I'd want a two to one or three to one advantage. If he gets uh, a three to one, I feel like Curtis can is the favorite. Yeah. Two to one, it's a toss up. And if it doesn't get to two to one, I think you made case Richie's the favorite. I mean, Curtis Gregory has every if you could if you could dream up what a politician would be. Oh well, yeah. He's the for, guy for like folks that, that have traditionally got elected, it's Curtis Gregory. But if you could set in a coffee shop in the suburbs of what a what a politician would be, and, and look, it's and, duck. And you know Doug, this, Curtis. Sorry, but Curtis Doug would fit. Curtis would fit the Senate well. He's independent, strong. Well, there's uh, a case that Doug would fit the Senate well. Just say, it, burn it all down, screw you. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, I think Doug Ritchie's a very good politician. Right. I think underestimating him is a significant mistake. And I think Curtis Gregory's gonna. It's gonna take every bit of that political yep. star talent you talked about for him to win that race. And the uh, the the. The key there is that that's a safe R seat either way. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, the key I'm to you. Rate it toss the key up. to Cindy, it would not be that case. I don't have a, a horse in that race, but I think Gregory would be a great a great attribute in the Senate. 
Oh, on there district. you go. All right, give me, give it. But let's talk about who's going to win it. I mean, obviously, if you're Cindy O'Loughlin, you know who you want. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you're, I guess, if you're Rick Bratton, you know who you want. Uh, uh, who's going to actually win that race? <laughs> I'll give it to Gregory. He's got the mayor of Paris. Excuse yep. me, the mayor of Atlanta, um, and Axiom, and uh, that that's is Axiom the, territory up there. It is, and I think they have some pride in it. And I think Aaron, there you go, um, wants wants a lot, uh, wants him to win it. And Aaron has got um, a pretty strong will and good organization. Truman just told me if Aaron Baker wins that seat, he has fifty yard first row, fifty yard line tickets for any game he wants this fall. And I'll buy him the popcorn and soda. Uh, on the 25th, oh, you got Jason Bean. <laughs> uh, all Jason right, let's Bean, talk. 25th, safe R. Well, we, we, you skipped one. Who did I see? Oh, 23. I'm so sorry. I think this is the most interesting race in all the primaries. I absolutely think this is. Uh, I don't know much about the Democrat, Matt Williams. Uh, Flat Doug tells me he's not going to win. Uh, 3D Doug chalks him up a little bit. Um, Flat Doug's usually a little more honest about these yeah, things than 3D Doug. So That's I think Phil Cristinelli, even with abortion, it's safe R. That is a very pro life district. That's why you have to give the early nod. Rich Crismer looks a lot like Mark Carter. Rich is known, he's been elected, <laughs> he's been a fierce pro life uh, activist, and he's ahead in the polls, but he won't raise any money. So I think it comes down between Adam Schnelting and and Phil Cristofanelli. I personally think Phil Cristofanelli could be governor of the state of Missouri one day. I think you talk about a transformational yep. guy. I think he could be much more that than Weber because he's being the majority. A lot of this right-wing stuff that folks tweet about and face and talk about that's all just bullshit. It never adds up. You put C Curtis Trent and Phil Cristofanelli in the same state Senate, those two could take this goofy right-wing stuff everyone rolls their eyes about that's just done to kiss ass for fundraising. The two of them could make it work. They could actually come together and create policies to actually do it. I think Phil Cristofanelli could be governor one day. Um, I think this would be one of his toughest races. Adam Schelting has a lot of backing, serious candidate. Phil's not I, – I, I, I get you get reports from Bolin. I get reports from Brewster Groot on the weekends, walking around uh, St. Charles, knocking doors. Yep. Uh, he had a long – hit a long day uh, Sunday, but he had a great day yep. Saturday was the reports I heard. This is all. This is none of this. A physicist from a group text. Well, look, that was telling look jokes. Chris, uh, 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 Chris Finelli has been knocking on doors. He starts out behind um, the Missouri's number one pollster. Um, just gave us a message, and and I agree. Uh, he's showing that Chrisma is neck and neck with Phil. Phil is doing everything uh, the right campaign looks like. Uh, Phil is knocking on doors. He's got Super Bruce DeGroote, and and look, I call him Super because. He is one of the, I think, stars in the Senate. He was there neck and neck or uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder with Curtis mm -hmm. Trent. Uh, he's a loyalist. Uh, he's come a long way from his house time and he's engaged in that race. Curtis, uh, Kurt, Curtis Trent is engaged in that race. Others are. I think the education reform people come in heavily there. And, and Phil. It's, it's, it's almost like yeah. VLTs and Denny. Yeah. If the education reform people don't come in for Phil, other people are going to be like, okay, now wait a minute. This guy did this for you, and you ghosted him. What? I, I think it's it's one of those. He is so closely identified with that issue. If yeah. they don't come in big for him, other people are going to be like, yeah, yeah, but Phil was really with you, you know, and you kind of didn't come through. Yeah, it, there was a question here about um, about Rich Crismer Jr., who all of us know in politics. You know, I I get a sense that Rich Crismer Sr. is his own person. <laughs> Uh, and of course, his son and family is loyal, but I'm not sure it gives much of a boost there. But I, I give this one; it's a safe R. I give it to uh, I give a fairly strong lean to Cristofanelli. I think that Adam. But it's is a real going, race. It's a it real is a real race. race. But look, Adam Adam's sort of one note. He's getting trial bar money from trial bar people. Yeah, but the who, Republicans have never taken any uh, your regular Republicans. I don't think they care about the issue. No, they've look, never you, taken any vengeance on that. You got the trial bar who is is generally liberal, uh, that is supporting a guy who's clearly has a lot of hate speech speech issues, uh, who is trying to make uh, heterosexuals and transgendered the the front of his campaign and some clever guys attacking Phil Cristofanelli. And to that regard, I think it's cheap shot. 
He's got it's one disgusting. note and, and the trial bar that's supporting him, in my opinion, uh, you know, they don't really see eye to eye with him on this. So it sort of shows that this well, is, I agree with you, but I also say, David, they've supported some pretty out there right wingers. You, you can buy crazy cheaper. You just can. It's been a great strategy for them that no, no group has improved their standing faster and more effectively than Mata. And they, they have shown they don't care what these guys say about these other groups. Their members don't care. And they've yep. also shown they can win. So and, and the Republican Party has never, ever, ever once. You can't show right. me a time. They've showed they give a damn. By the way, you're always getting me in trouble. Uh, I see Keller Gregory said that we Yeah, forgot. you screwed up. I was going to point that out. You, Would you, you point that out now, please? Please point that out now. Well, I mean, I was going to point this out until David interrupted me Thank you. about how the real MVP of that race would be Kella Gregory. But, but Kella, David interrupted me. I'm sorry. Uh, Stein and knowledge to you. Uh, Kel, we got to send her one of these great United Fiber uh, Yetes. I'll get right on it. For taking the time. I know this is not your, you actually do have a little bit of work to these days. I'm going to send you a United Fiber uh, iron skillet for Audra. So if you could, Kelton, let's make sure he gets this. These, uh, uh, just in case there's a problem at the house now, Kella Audra's got her. Uh, she just and has and to, it's also going to sit there in case Kella needs to come over and use it on you. She has a look her family warned me about. She doesn't need a fry pan. Uh, and it's so far <laughs> it's worked. So 25th, we talked about Bean has got his settled, race settled. He can look at leadership and other things. Yep. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think that story is told. Jason has done a great job. No one thought they could beat him, and no one can. No and he one could have on bigger things. So, twenty seven. What an interesting race! How funny is it that you Cape people? It, let me just tell you: for if you're from Semo, none of us like people from Cape. We just don't. Jackson's okay. Gordonville's Tom Schultz. It's good people. None of us like Cape people. Uh, the Limbaugh's kind of get an exception ish. The Grimm's, he's just a good dude. But it's generally, we might make small exception to Cape people. Nobody in SEMO likes Cape folks, which is why I think it was a major advantage for Jason Smith in the congressional race. None of us like you guys. And it's funny to us that you don't even have a state senator now. That is just, I mean, Stein and Knowledge cheers to the people of the 27th. And now it looks like, again, you might not have a state senator. You know what? I think an, uh, an honest arbitra arbitrator of this issue is Russ Oliver. Uh, and you ought to look at his comment. I, I, I've always thought he was a scribe and a, and a scholar, uh, and I follow him. So without... Uh, All right, Kelton, what did Russ say? Russ said, that the definition of irony is Scott complaining about someone interrupting him. <laughs> so okay, fair uh, play. we've got District 27. Here's how I see it. it again, I think Christina Dinkins, um, Brett's mom, uh, which is a tough thing. You know, I, I could not imagine running my mom's campaign. Tough, yeah. I would be petrified. Someone would hurt her at the same time, not wanting to disappoint her. So, Brett, my heart goes out to you. I know you're doing everything you can to to for your family. And that's uh, that's an honorable and, thing. And, and on her campaign. I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to say I don't know if it was Brett or who. But as far as the campaign goes, she has been grabbing every little thing and maximizing it. As far as what you can. I mean, the fact of the matter is. Iron County is a very small part of that district. Uh, yes. It would be it would be very tough to win that Senate seat from Iron County. Also, I, the population centers in Cape. She's got to drive two hours to go to an event there. Hour yeah, and a half. I don't know the full details. After Red is to grab dollars. Grab about how worthless we are, and I'm going to interrupt you because just just to do that. Well, uh, no, you kidding. should. But that, remember that immigrant oh. thing she got on? Oh, she grabbed onto something with the illegal oh, immigrants and did a great oh, job with it. And knocked it out of the park. Uh, she's They've been grabbing. It's every little thing they could do to grab onto it. But, I mean, when you look at the numbers, it would be an uphill climb. Yes. So uh, you, you hit it right. Again, she ideologically probably looks more like you would uh, elect nowadays in a Republican primary. I give her that. But she comes. Jamie Jamie's uh, base is even more substantial than I've seen in any other race because Scott County has transitioned over the years to being one of the poorest yep. Republican primary counties to the second best. And he definitely has that. And there's a certain nature about Scott County Republicans. I'll have benefited he from that. Yes. And second, he has been vested in the Cape Girardeau community yeah. long enough. He's got Peter Kinder. He's got Lloyd Smith. He's got, you know, John Thompson from 
Jackson, the uh, banker. He's got everybody that I know there. So he's got Kate, Scott. I think he's tying uh, uh, Bollinger and Perry down, and you just can't win um, with if well, you don't have that base. And here's the other problem for her. Jacob Turner is a libertarian. He ran against uh, run against ran against a uh, ran for Congress. He sort of takes some of that alt right too. So anybody that Jamie's not getting that part of the country, he's getting. And he's My working. Guess is Jamie gets fifty eight percent, and the other two split it. She'll get a little more than Jacob, but Jacob's got enough money to be relevant. <laughs> yeah, and he's hustling. Both. I mean, I mean Jacob state- Turner is out. Work. He he's yeah. like the Jonah Cola of this cycle. That yeah. dude's working it. And I, I, I'm with you. I, I think it's another headwind on the Dean's campaign. But that Turner dude, I mean, he raised 100 grand. I mean, he has been out shaking the bushes. I, I, obviously, he's going to have to have some some breaks to win this race. But he's yep. a name you're going to hear again. Jamie Berger, two things that he's going for him. One, if he wins this, we can still make fun of you guys for not having a senator. That's the number one thing. Number two, and I think Russ Olive would bag me up on that, actually. And I'd like to hear from him right now. Do you think it'd be funny if they don't have a senator? Um and number two, I do think that he is raising money like no other. I, I think he's up to over a, ha- a quarter million dollars on hand right now. And a lot of that yeah. is that Cape Girardeau money of them saying, okay, you're our guy. They're not just telling him that. They're actually writing a check. Uh, I, yeah. I do think Berger's got a lot of uh, money be, ahead one behind him. And he'll be like Curtis Gregory. He'll be a great senator. Yep. He's got Let the personality uh, like a Sirpoy and some of the others that just wear well in the Senate and he'll get a lot done. And that's important. To How do you the, fend uh, off the attack of being a Democrat? By the way, that the, the grand poobah has spoken. Russ Oliver says Kate deserves it more than anywhere else. I think we can adjudicate what and kiss ass and stop right there. Yep. Well, that's I think that just invalidates his other point. What a no. kiss ass. Uh, uh, come on. Oh my God. So Russ. I think it's burger. I think Berger in that. I think it's true. I think, I, although it's going to be interesting to see how he handles the attack of being an elected Democrat. I mean, that's the attack on him. I'm sure you know he'll what? get it. How Scott, he handles that's going to be interesting. Scott, let me just tell you this, is that down there, most grandparents were Democrats. Most parents were Democrats. Yeah. And they are the, the most solid conservatives today. But Scott County, uh, especially Madison County, Anybody that's not a Republican in Bollinger, Cape County, or Perry County, they're going to connect to him when he talks about, I mean, Republicans were sort of the obnoxious people in the boot hill, and they were only a few of them. Everybody was conservative, though, and because you were Republican didn't make you more conservative. Uh, you know, uh, the only thing I've ever point. seen anyone in SEMO ever say a nice thing about Cape for, like Russ did, was because they're running for Congress. I've never seen anybody from South Israel ever say anything nice about Cape unless they're running for Congress. I don't know if that's oh, an wait, announcement. Russ did. did correct me. I said a Cape senator. I called Jamie a Cape senator because people in Cape think he's one of theirs. And that just tells you how good a politician he's from North Scott yes. County, yet they think he's his, that theirs in Cape. So, so I the 29th, correct. Mike Moon yeah. against Susan Hinder- Harlson. Uh, Tell uh, folks about Susan Harlson, other than she's going to get a lot of Jorgen money. Yes. So Susan is a... Uh, she is a businesswoman from Christian County, which is 48% or more of the district. Moon has not run in. Uh, Susan uh, owns a about eight uh, healthcare franchises. Um, pre- Can she come in with her own money? She has got personal money. I think she will have some broad support. Um, and, you know, I think she could probably rattle a chicken uh, as good as Mike Moon, maybe even with only looking at the chicken could snap its neck. Uh, and wouldn't have to throw it around. But here's the thing about it. Mike Moon is not going to be comfortable with a woman like Susan, a professional woman. Whatever it is, whether it's 12-year-old women marrying off, whether it's some of the other things, clearly he's going to be very uncomfortable with a woman. And Is she going to be comfortable with him, though? Oh, yes, yes. I She's, mean, look, uh, Mike Moon, we all know a version of Mike Moon, right? Yeah, and, and and I'll let everybody decide. I I actually have had a, a good. I mean, I I like Mike Moon personally, and and I know some folks. You know, when I tell people that in, at dinner, they kind of curl their nose up or whatever. But the fact is, back home, he's not the cutting up a chicken guy. He he's the guy with a great mustache who's very gentlemanly, well dressed, and you talk and the trial bar. That was kind of my goes, first thing to come in for him. They I agree. Look, it goes down to some of the same them- thematics in the other races. 
she's got a geographic advantage. She's never run in that dist in that part of the district. She's and never ran huge. before. Period. That is has. correct. But but he is not running that area. He's run before, which is good. Ideologically, maybe he sounds more like some of the people there. But I actually think, look, when a guy can't get into the Freedom Caucus, who wants in it like that. That says something, and I'll go even further with Mike. Mike has a veneer that he's a nice guy, just a good guy. But I've already watched tactically. He's playing some really mean games and and uh, stirring the pot <laughs> way that, that clearly. Oh, I um, think that Dan Hageman stunt's gonna gonna hurt him. There's I a whole lot of things he likes to play games, stab people in the back. He's a guy. Don't get your. I mean, he might smile and wear overalls, but when it comes down to it, and choke a chicken here and there. But when it comes down to it, I think the guy is an ass. You can't really judge either of those things, David. I, I get it, but I like her. I think it would be a very competitive race. I think she's going to work hard. He always works hard. He is a very good competitor. This is uh, a lean I, moon I, race to start with right now, it, right? As we a, talk about this. Long it's Republican, lean moon, right? I, I would lean to moon, but I think if she runs the right campaign, she can win. Uh, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a fascinating race. 31st. And I know uh, as we as we top the hour mark here, Rick Bratton, Mike Kavner, Dan Houks, uh, big big week last week for Rick Bratton. Yeah. So, um, and I'll need to tie this down because I know you've got your time. So, I think Rick has got the geographic advantage. Uh, he ran sure. for Congress. He's got some name ID. I think Mike Hafner cuts that geographic advantage somewhat and that ideological advantage. But then you've got to take Dan Halk. Dan Halk has got a geographic advantage himself and as a different part of the district. I think this is, I'll lean it towards Bratton, but I think sure. that that Hafner and particularly Halk, normally I would say having two in against incumbent favors the incumbent. In this case, it's a unique dynamic yep. that I think it could be a toss up. It's going to come down to who runs the better race, but I have to give a little bit of, of the nod to Bratton just because he's the incumbent. I would have said this rate. You could have convinced me of a toss up a lot easier before Rick killed the landfill. And oh, yeah. while everyone in Jeff City will tell you 50 ways, but but back home, that's how they're going to view this. The land, I um, should have, you're right. The landfill issue is what could actually even it up or turn it other, the other way. Because you got a guy that's kind of out there and, yep. and doesn't really accomplish much. Then he accomplishes something in, in real. It kind of ties it all together. I think Rick Bratton's a stronger candidate and this look, week than he was and, last week. And how, and, 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 um, um, uh, Mike Hafner have, have very good personalities and uh, totally different kinds of people, yep. but really strong personalities. And so if anybody can do it, they can. And again, I like that Dan comes from the rural part of it, which makes him particularly stronger in, a, in mm -hmm. one area. I, I like his chances. Last Travis rate. Smith, Brad Hudson. What a what an interesting thing. Uh, you got Travis, uh, you got, uh, Brad Hudson from the Branson area. Stone County folks, you got Travis Smith from the rest of the district. Who wins that? So they both have geographic advantages in that race. Uh, I like Travis's more on the eastern side, but I give uh, Brad a little advantage because of the religiosity of the district and his position as a minister. Uh, Travis, however, has never met one, a person that he that he couldn't convince or like. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's a fascinating dynamic. You've got one guy preaching, <laughs> one guy that you can't not like. Uh, I like the dynamics of this race. Uh, I've been in that district for years with Carla Esslinger, Mike Cunningham before that. Um, and to that regard, uh, I like I like Travis Smith's chances, but Brad is going to be a very strong competitor. What's going to come down to is where the money goes, where the school choice money goes, where uh, groups like the Carpenters go where the lobbying community goes. My guess is that they should end up with Travis um, based mean. on who would be the better senator in the Senate. But, you know, Brad Hudson, like I said, he's going to be a tough competitor. Uh, and What fundraising know, advantage does Travis Smith need to win that race? Um, well, in that one, it's a very efficient market. Two to one gives you a huge advantage. And you've got Axiom working with uh, – Brad, uh, so he's not going to make mistakes. It's going to have to be a well-run campaign by either or. Cool. D David Barklage, I would kiss your ass and thank you more, but I know you got to go. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, sir. And I'll get this to Audra, so mind your P's and Q's. Well, I'll have to. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Pierre. I hope I, I didn't offend anybody, but who I meant to. So Yeah. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Thank you. That was David Barklage, dean of the Missouri Republican Party. Nobody knows more about politics than him. 
Uh, I, you know, and, and again, you can text me if you want to. You have been. I get it. David has clients. He deals with them. Uh, it, I, I, th I think he gives you as good a look as he can give while he works for folks. The truth is anybody that knows that much about politics can be working for somebody. Uh, I love to sit and listen to him, and I love the procedural questions. Thank you so much for all the feedback from last time. This time, the state Senate primary is even more personal, interesting. Uh, text me anytime. You can, hey, 429-5770, text me anytime. I uh, love to hear from folks, even while we're doing the show. Uh, we'll have a show this week, Kelton. We don't know who the hell's on it yet, do we? It's Monday. Hell, give we us a break. probably figure that out. Yeah, we should get on that. That's Eclipse, right? I mean, they don't even have the legislature today. Thank you, guys, and we will see you back here later this week for a midweek update and then Sunday.